on the two occasions, about four years ago and then two years later, I had a long, long conversation with Omar Suleiman that he became the vice president and now he's probably been eased away completely from power. And the, the long hours I spent with him talking was, he said to me, uh, I said to him, you know, talking about reforms, uh, my feeling, because he said, you Americans don't understand what it takes. We can't just introduce political reforms and election. The result will be disastrous. At the time, he was more focused on if this is to happen, the Muslim Brotherhood will immediately become the number one party and they will take over and they'll convert to Egypt just like Iran becomes autocratic state and all of that. And he may have had a, may have a point making that argument at the time. So at the then he said, you know, and, and I, as a, as a political scientist, was involved in, 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 in this type of issues. I agreed with him only to, to the extent that whereas political reforms anywhere in the Arab world and many other countries in the world are absolutely critical, that is, in terms of moving toward a, a democratic form of government. You know, we live in a democracy, we know the advantages and the disadvantages of this. It's, a never, not a, it's not a perfect system. It has never been a perfect political system, but it's the best of what there, of there is, considering all other political systems. So for us to move into some political reform that are, can be sustainable, we have to ask ourselves the question, what are the fundamentals on which you can in fact build reforms as such, this is democratic reform, that can be sustained. And that is, so we will use Egypt and we, could, we can use a few other examples, uh, a few other city countries as an example, because on, in, in, on, in, you know, in theory, and this is where this administration has already made and is making now, I think, a terrible mistake. It's been saying, you know, the Egyptian military now that has taken over, it must move expeditiously toward the political reform, rewrite the constitution, and that's how it's supposed to be in order for the people to be free and be able to live in, in, in freedom and all of that. In theory, this is fine. That's perhaps how it should be. But the, in, practical, in practical terms, what does it really mean? Going back to my initial conversation with, with, with uh, Omar at the time, he said to me, and I might have told you the story because it was, it's relevant to he said to me, you know, can I ask you a favor? I said, yeah, I said, I'll, I'll, give, I'll have my driver. will take you 20 kilometers north of here. There's an area called, uh, I want to call it Selwan, but I don't, I'm not sure of the, of the name. I forgot it since. Just look at it and come back, and then we'll continue our discussion. I have a meeting I'll attend to, and then I'll we'll free myself for the afternoon. And this is exactly what I did. I went there, but it's about a three-hour trip. Went one way. Now, what I went to see, uh, in fact, uh, subsequently, I, could, I really, really felt sick. And I'm not just uh, thinking I'm sick, but actually I started to throw up. I couldn't deal with what I have seen. What I have seen is an area, I don't know, maybe 10, 10 kilometers long or maybe a couple of kilometers wide, inhabited by nearly a million and a half Egyptians. Honestly, you know, almost everywhere you go, you see kids between one and five or six. You see like a black wave moving in the dirt everywhere. There is no housing, there is no sewage, there is no electricity. Shacks is just all over and, and kids, you know, wallowing in the mud. How majority, many of them are completely naked the little one especially. And those are four or five, you know, they have something covering themselves a little bit. Especially there it was hot, you know, you don't need to have any clothing to begin with. And, and the flies and the dirt is, is, is so overwhelming. In fact, I had to rush back into the car and then like a swarm of hundreds and hundreds of kids came in a converge onto the car. Everybody wants to have, you know, some kind of uh, a little bit of money. 
and and the driver saying, you know, we are if we don't move, we could be turned over. It's going to be danger. We can get killed in, a, in a, accidentally by cars. Then we we move back. So I went back. And I sat with him again. He said, now talk to me about democracy. And the point that he wanted to make, it is not that he's, uh, he's not um, responsible for any of this. But the point that he wanted to make then, that is, when you have conditions such as this, now Egypt with 80 million people, and think in these terms that more than 60 million of them are under the poverty line. Which means they have to live on less than two dollars a day, a family. Now, this is how poor, stricken country it is. And now, when there's, there's no enough food, certainly very poor health care, if it exists at all. Joblessness is 25-30%. You go to Cairo and you see hundreds, thousands and thousands of people roaming in the street. You wonder sometimes how come they don't eat, eat, eat each other or kill each other. But the Egyptians have a very unusual and a beautiful disposition. They take life differently than we do. They have a tremendous sense of humor. And I think if Egypt had lasted to, as long as it has in these dismal conditions since 19, you know, from time for hundreds of years, it's because of the inherent sense of humor that they have. Terrific sense of humor. And they just move about laughing about their plight and their miserable situation. But the question was always came is, how do you change? What, what sort of change are you going to go through? in order so that any reform becomes sustainable. Now you ask almost any Egyptian in the street under 18, what do you want to do first? Do you want food, clothing, shelter, education, or do you want to vote first? That is really what comes down to, in terms of this, what you hear, what you basically hear, you know, uh, <clears throat> I don't want reform now and food a year from now. I want f f food and freedom together. That is, they do not want to have the opportunity to go and vote when in fact they have nothing to eat, when they in fact they have nothing to put on, when in fact they cannot go attend a school, when in fact they have no health care whatsoever. So the idea, the sense of I'm, I'm free to vote, because if you give the freedom, and, and perhaps you should, the question is, in, under what fashion? When the people have absolutely nothing, what are you going to use this freedom with, for? You're going to use the freedom in order to make your point. You're going to go out in the street again, and now be, be even far more violent, because you have nothing. So you use the freedom as a means by which to express your anger, your frustration, your disgust, your pain, your agony, your hopelessness. And that inadvertently breeds, un breeds violence. So his point, uh, uh, Omar Suleiman point was at the time, we give them this freedom without giving them the substances, the means, the, without restoring some human dignity to them, it's going to only lead to more unrest and more violence. He has a point there. But the point stops right there because then comes the question, what are you doing about it in order to change the scenario? That is really the fundamental question that is facing the Arab world today, and I want you to understand it very, very carefully. That is, notwithstanding the oil riches, the money that comes from oil, the money that the Arab world is receiving from, uh, from oil, it's not evenly distributed. There are only a few countries like Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Abu Dhabi and others, and some Algeria and a few others, who actually have this huge revenue of oil, and are certainly not distributing equally with the rest of the Arab world. And specifically today, for example, this year Egypt became net importer of oil, just to export oil until a year ago. As a matter of fact, Israel used to import much of Egyptian oil from the Sinai. 
Now Israel import basically the gas from the Saudi. But Egypt became a net importer of oil for its own domestic consumption. Now going back then to the to the people themselves, whereas every bone in my body screams for freedom, and I will not settle for anything less. I cannot imagine, honestly, I cannot imagine what does what how how it how it feels to live in a society when you're not free to say what you want to say, express yourself in any manner, write what you want to write, wear what you want to wear, eat what you want to eat. To me, this is an imaginable option if you don't have this basic rights. But if I want to provide these basic rights to everybody else, specifically in countries like Egypt, I don't want just to provide a a sense or, or it's a, uh, a view of it, I want them really to have it. I want them really to have it and be able to keep it and sustain it and build on it. And then I'm, I must tell you today, when I hear President Obama say to the, to the, the military government now, you have to move toward reform, you have to have an election within the next three, four months, by September the latest, I often ask, I ask myself, is this man insane? Does he really understand what he is talking about? What does it take for us to understand that if you are not ready, fully prepared for an election, you're going to end up with what's happened in, in, with the Palestinian? That is, any group that is today fully organized, well organized, such as the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, or Hamas then in 2006, or, or uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon, these are the groups who are very well organized politically. If the moment there is an election, they're going to be able to win, at least relatively speaking, to the rest of the political parties that are not organized as yet. But my concern is not only the fear that religious group will come to the fore and be able to grab 